Okay, uh, hello everyone. So I'm Marcos uh, Barreto, I'm from the yes. department. So thanks, uh, Dimitra and the Ed Center for the invitation. Uh, I'm here from uh, on behalf of the uh, Genial uh, uh, Fox Group. And this is pretty much about uh, AI coding or uh, AI assisted coding or coding with AI. There's a bunch of names we have been uh, seen these days. And I would like to start with this uh, 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 summary from uh, New York Times, it's pretty much about uh, how the machines are finally uh, understanding us in terms of our own language. And this is uh, leading to some discussion in terms of whether uh, programming will be obsolete and, and we need to change our uh, write, writing uh, programs by some training models. So this is the overall concern, I think. Uh, and this is, has been considered some sort of a uh, game changer for, especially for software, for software uh, development. Um, I personally like number eight because I have my background in computer science. So we knew this uh, kind of things that code is not important and we knew this for decades. And if you go to six, it's pretty much about some sort of uh, how do you specify your requirements and you have a very precise uh, 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 specification of your uh, requirements. So this is the big picture in terms of uh, uh, AI coding. Uh, this is uh, from uh, last year. So this uh, on the right side is pretty, pretty much a paper from DeepMind uh, showing alpha code. It's a kind of a, la la a large language model. Uh, and uh, talking about the performance, so uh, alpha code was used to uh, generate answers to 10 different computing uh, programming contests. And overall, it performs quite well. So it's like, uh, I, I, I didn't know the results from this year, but we can expect that the, this type of uh, uh, software will be beating us again. So this is what we expect in terms of coding. Uh, just to give you two examples before we look into this uh, AI. So this is one approach we use for uh, database uh, uh, teaching. It's pretty much about what we call model uh, definition and uh, more on the database modeling. You don't need to go to, to read all that. It's pretty much about we uh, when we teach database design, we provide students with this mini world description, which is pretty much a, a context with uh, all the entities, relationships, and all the elements we expect from a database. And then we uh, teach students how to transpose this context contextual uh, a definition to something like a conceptual model. It's pretty much a visual representation of this uh, uh, database. And once the students has, have this conceptual model, we ask them, okay, go ahead and do your relational model. And the relational model is pretty much the database design. You'll be creating tables to store your, your data. And you see, we can move from uh, coding from scratch. You can just sit down in front of a terminal and type all comments. We can go use some sort of a, a, a web form or some sort of IDE. You fill in some forms, you check a couple of check boxes, and you get the code, or you can go and see, well, let's use something more abstract and go to some graphic shapes, and you ask to export your model. At the end, you get the same code as you get with the uh, typing or a scratching approach. It's pretty much about the level of abstraction you have for designing your database. In terms of uh, uh, machine learning, so we have this pipeline-based approach, and this is specifically for convolutional neural network. Uh, we go to some sort of uh, a standard pipeline. So we, we, we teach students how to structure the code in terms of some sort of uh, uh, specific functions. And suppose your model is something like a convolutional neural network. It's a very complicated one. So each uh, square will be a mathematical function or what we call a layer. And we teach students how to code all these layers to get some results at the end. So basically you pass an image, and you apply several layers, several mathematical functions uh, to identify some patterns, and you ask the model to classify this image between, let's say, dogs and cats or whatever. And this model can be something like, uh, uh, you can code all this model from scratch again. You can go layer by layer specifying all parameters, or you can just rely on some pre-built model, and in this case, it's VGG, and then you are just relying on someone else's code, and you just go up on your level of abstraction, okay? It's pretty much, again, specification. Just to give you a second example in terms of how we evolved in terms of computer programming. So we managed to uh, move from punch cards, and we uh, were, had to learn how to specify code using machine language, 
And then at some point we were able to use something called assembly language. And then you sit down and type your comments and you get some code which refers to the machine code. And then if you go and you uh, 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 a bit higher, so uh, you go to some sort of IDE again and you pro program this using high level abstractions. And then we uh, had the opportunity to play with notebooks, let's say for 2010 or so. Uh, most of these notebooks, so this is a standard way we do data science today. We go to this uh, notebook web-based uh, interfaces. We have something like a code completion. So we start typing our common and the tool will finish for you. And now we have something that uh, Fabio was mentioning so in terms of uh, task description. So it's pretty much about the, the prompt you pass to your um, um, software. Just try to move this perhaps. Okay, so this is what we call prompt engineering. It's pretty much about task description. And you see, you get the same results and you can just get some code. You can paste this into a notebook and get something running. So uh, this will be about uh, prompt engineering. So as we'll be marking prompts, so this is something we need to learn today. It's pretty much about how you can structure your prompts. And there is a bunch of different models and different structures. Uh, I borrowed this from the uh, um, Moodle course on generative AI, this idea of tap and taste. Uh, it's pretty much about some concepts that you, you need to uh, look uh, when you are designing your prompts, okay? There is a bunch of uh, prompt engineering cheat sheets, so everyone is trying to give the best 10 prompts for whatever problem you have, and there's a kind of following this structure, okay? The last point is about this one. So uh, we are be talking about this idea of whether to resist, whether to embrace. I personally like the idea of embracing AI. So this is why I'm running this focus group with, with my colleagues. Uh, but you see on the embrace side, we have something that was mentioned uh, earlier about how we can uh, teach our students to do some sort of code reading, coding critique, how we can uh, 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 encourage students to work collaboratively with AI. And this paper brings some, several questions that we can discuss. Uh, one of them is about mental models. So the idea we have about uh, uh, how generative AI works and produce outputs, is a kind of the mental model we have from the model, from these, these models. Uh, this idea of ped pedagogical scaffolds and AI-aware uh, pedagogy, which I think is something very, very uh, uh, interesting to explore a little bit more is something that how we can introduce a more pedagogical concepts into these tools because again the tools are uh, intended to uh, uh, accelerate production, accelerate code design. So you are not interested in, in pedagogical steps. You just want to generate code faster and faster and faster. But it's something that we can explore the idea of equity and access and, all, and also this idea of programming being different from computing, because we can use these tools to teach program to uh, those who don't need to be programmers. We can just play with this level of abstractions, okay? Uh, I can skip this one just to keep the pace, but there's some, some discussion about this uh, 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 way we can explore. And I can talk a little bit about Genio. Uh, so Genio is a joint collaboration of, between statistics and the Data Science Institute. I mean, just co-leading this project with Jonathan. And we also have some other colleagues around. So Gita, Francesca, Anania, and Leonard. So this is the core team. We have several people supporting us uh, from Eden Center, uh, Jenny Marina, who is giving us a very, very uh, extreme support. So thank you so much. Uh, we, uh, we started this in July and we picked four case studies, three undergraduate courses and one postgraduate courses. We are running on this term, auto term, and then next term, winter term. And we try to see, okay, how we can introduce AI on these courses and which specific tasks we'll be assessing uh, to these courses. And then we pick two courses from the data science, much more on, on uh, students who have, let's say, perhaps less background on technical sides, and then we pick something for database, second year undergraduate course, and then deep learning. And the idea for deep learning is how we can use generative AI to teach, to teach AI. So it's something like uh, use the tool to teach about the tool. And the methodology is pretty much about some pair programming. So we ask the students to do human and human against human and AI. So we, we pass pretty much the same activity. So now you can sit down with your colleagues and, and try to solve this. And now you sit alone and you can use any AI tools and try to come with the same results. And at the end, we ask the students to do some reflection in terms of how AI has helped or not, 
and which type of uh, uh, which sense we can get from this, this okay? So we, we use some tool, some weeks without any AI tools, other weeks we allow the students to use AI tools explicitly, other tools we leave them free to choose whether to use or not, but we ask them to acknowledge for any user, etc. Uh, we start this with about 48, 50 students. That is some overlapping. So this was the initial opt-in survey. Uh, we tried to figure out in terms of uh, previous uh, uh, experience with programming. So we run some sort of uh, questionnaire for uh, whether they have some programming experience from, from these uh, students, just to try to see, okay, which level we can explore with these tools. Uh, we asked them about some... Uh, very, very known uh, AI tools, and it puts uh, Grammarly in the middle, just intentionally say, okay, have you spot the Grammarly is a, is a kind of a AI tool as well, and using even more generative AI concepts. And we, of course, ChatGPT is the most popular one, but we got some very specific models and students who have experience with some specific models. Uh, Again, just to check which models are more suitable for the study. Uh, we asked them about, okay, have you ever used these models before for learning something? This was not related to any courses. It's just, okay, you use this on your, on your daily activities to try to learn something. And we try to get some sense of this. Most students say, yes, we are using this for several things. And the last is about, okay, and what do you think about AI? So it was useful for you in terms of uh, 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 learning something. Is the tool really, really helping you in, in terms of your learning experience? So this was the first uh, uh, initial. Then we propose some activities during this course. So this is for a database. Uh, we provide the students with this contextual prompt. I think it's not so good for reading, but we are describing some sort of database context on the left. Uh, uh, to chat PT, or I have this database with these entities, these attributes, etc. And then at the bottom, we are asking for a specific question. Can you help me to solve a particular problem? And then we get some answer on the uh, top right in terms of performing aggregation functions, which is pretty much doing some calculation using numerical data. And the code we get from chat PT is quite useful. You can copy and paste, and you are able to get some results from your database most of the time. And then we move to another task, which is pattern matching. It's pretty much uh, recognizing some patterns using text data. And surprisingly, we, we get some very bad results, very uh, poor code from ChatGPT. And this is supposed to be a text to text model. So we are saying, okay, pattern matching will be very easy because it's kind of text to text stuff. But we copy and paste this code and we didn't manage to get any results from the tool. And we start stressing the tool saying, okay, the code is wrong. Can you give me another solution? And then the model picks some other probabilities and generates some other potential code. And you paste the code against the database and say, okay, no results so far. Can you give me another solution? And we keep purging the model. At some point, the model say, okay, I cannot help you with this one. I have exhausted all my probabilities. I have no other clue to generate any code for you. You're on your own. So yeah, so this okay. So this is kind of the test we were doing with students. Uh, we did the same with the uh, joining, the kind of aggregating information from different tables. And we get something useful most of the time, especially if you go to very simple joining. So the two tables joining some information, but if you go to more complex stuff, the code is not so useful as well. We ask for explanation in terms of a piece of code. So we provide some sort of code. If you, can you give me some explanation in terms of this code? And the result is pretty much something like, okay, not good, not bad, because most of the time the model is just reading your code and saying, oh, you have this variable with this name, and then the next line you have this common, and the next line you do something. It's pretty much something, okay, but I know this one because I wrote this code, so you need to tell me what I have in my code. I, I, I'm asking for some more formal explanation or so, and then the tool is not so able to give you something useful in terms, it's pretty much reading your coding for you and try to explain something that you have created. Okay. Uh, this is another approach we use, uh, Copilot. I just finished my last one. Uh, so this is Jonathan using a GitHub Copilot. So Copilot is a model tailored for coding. It's trained over uh, a bunch of Python and other uh, coding programs. And then we uh, expect to have a few more, uh, let's say, usable stuff from Copilot. And we use this to our students as well. We provide some prompts, or we ask the students to go with some prompts. 
and we go with this interactive process explaining how we can structure the code, okay? Uh, so every week we, we run this uh, survey and we ask students, okay, have you uh, used ChatGPT or whatever other uh, um, generative AI tool? Do you think this was useful in terms of learning experience? So our average rating so far is, uh, let's say, in the middle. Okay, so it's not good, not bad, but we are just doing this. Uh, we ask for some sort of, okay, the top key uh, words that you can remember from the, the lecture today. And uh, on, the, on the bottom right is uh, an example of the knowledge that we ask the students in terms of any assignment. Uh, to be clear, we are using just, uh, this just for a formative assignment. We are not touching any summative assignment. It's pretty much about code, okay? And this is the last one. It's just a, a piece of uh, final stuff. So it's just to provoke some discussion. But you see on the picture, it's pretty much about coding again. Okay? Thank you so much. <laughs>